Okay, thank you, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I wanted to discuss tonight remaining on the block schedule. I know you've heard a lot about going to a seven period schedule. I've spent a considerable amount of time researching this because I, I wasn't quite certain of what, was, what, what I was being told. Not that I didn't trust who was, was telling me, but I want to convey that message. But I do want to talk to you about staying on the block schedule. I'm going to be kind of herky-jerky because you've been provided the PowerPoint and there's no way I can get through all of it in five minutes. So forgive me. You already know there's going to be a loss of electives by about 25% for most students. If you currently have four electives, you're going down to three. To me, that's the biggest crutch of the issue here is the less opportunities for our kids to explore career pathways, college pathways, what have you. Eliminate uh, possible careers is a big issue for me. Uh, dropping down to a daily schedule is really harmful to, to classes that have job shadowing or community outreach as part of that. I understand Principal Norby wants us to do more community outreach. The block schedule accommodates that better than the seven period schedule. Passing is going to go from 24 to 40 minutes um, in a day. It's also going to be reduced per passing from six to five. And let me tell you, on that campus, trying to get from one end to the other in six minutes is already a challenge. Teachers are trying to make that same run that are teaching in more than one class. Okay, I'm not going to cover this information. I want to concentrate on what we've been told before the vote. And this isn't to be considered as a, a negative toward Principal Morales. He's an honorable man, and I'm going to explain why what he told us could be true from his point of view. And uh, I, we trust him. Most teachers trust him. Um, so he's told us for the last five years that I've been here, every time we come into a new year, and usually sometime in that year, that if we just adopt a seven period schedule, we'd see a cost savings, we'd see, forgive me for using Sarah Paul's notepad, uh, we'd see the research supported that the students do better and that we have smaller classroom size. Well, I want to focus on the research, and I gave you several examples, and of course I gave you examples that conveyed my point of view, which was the eight period schedule is better. Um, but what I found, and to be completely honest, Williams here subs it up really well. Uh, this is one of those items that, depending on who's doing the research, depends on whether they say the seven period daily is better or the block is better. Williams here compared Florida schools that were using both block and seven period schedule, and he looked at the uh, performance, academic performance, attendance, discipline, uh, national testing, and he did it over, I believe it was a 10 year period. So, and his conclusion was, in the blue, no significant difference in performance, attendance, or uh, discipline. Uh, he cautioned, and I point out, that making decisions on this willy-nilly uh, research that we have in regards to seven period versus block scheduling would be a mistake. And in fact, he even, he even suggested that you hire your own researcher before you make that decision. And I quote, districts can be, uh, can ill afford to predicate decisions that will affect so many key stakeholders on flawed information. I would agree with that statement. And my job tonight is to try to provide you with the contrary point of view, I guess, for lack of a better cost. The only way we save cost is if there is a reduction in staff. And Dr. Carlin, and Dr. Carlin is an honorable man, and I believe him completely when he says there's no intention of eliminating teaching positions. The electives that we're currently offering under the eight period schedule would be offered under the seven period. 
So there's no cost savings here by moving to this schedule. You've got the same number of teachers teaching, the same number of classes, there's no cost savings there. Unless we start to eliminate classes because we're offering less electives to the students, the students are choosing from a smaller number, and we start seeing electives eliminated because there's just not enough kids enrolling for them. That's the only scenario that I can see that would be a cost savings. And Thank you. Uh, smaller class size. My students actually came up with this data. The New York school said that uh, uh, class size is an average of 29 for a seven period block, 24 for a uh, block schedule. I don't understand. We've been told that due to increased contact time, we'd see lower numbers. I just can't see how that can be when you're dividing it among seven periods instead of eight. I posed this question to my students as a common core assignment. I wanted them to take a position and use the argumentative essay format to support their decision with research, with uh, backing, just like we're teaching them in class. Seventy-two percent of my kids said, and I'm dealing with the gifted population in case that matters in any way, 72% of my kids who got on there and started researching immediately said, no, we don't want to transition to a seven period schedule. And their responses are as follows. We're not going to have time for that. But they are included in the presentation which I gave you. And my kids, I'm very proud of them, managed to address everything that I would have said myself. And that's why I included those in this presentation. There's no bad guy. Thank you. There's no bad guy here. There really is. I respect everybody involved including my peers who decided to one that this is the way they want to go. I know I'm in the minority. I'm asking you to use your common sense and maintain the block schedule that we've been enjoying up to now, that we got the blue ribbon under, that we've got any number of accolades while using. It's not time to abandon that schedule. As a parent, as a teacher, I'm asking you, I'm begging you not to abandon the block schedule. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Carlin. Very much appreciate it. Today we're going to uh, use this meeting as uh, an opportunity to report back to the board on, I guess, a project that started two years ago at the behest of this board. This board, as part of board goal, uh, board initiative three, board goal 7.3, asked us to investigate scheduling models such as block schedule versus seven period days for grades nine through 12 to determine the best model for delivering instruction as well as the most efficient means for staffing. We've spent two years in progress of trying to do our best to meet uh, that board goal, and we're here to report to you the results today. First thing, uh, first thing we did in addressing that board goal was to construct a scheduling committee. This is in the 2013-14 school year. This scheduling committee uh, included representatives from every academy, multiple disciplines, uh, special education, physical education, career and technical education, counselors, district transportation director, uh, and Mr. Morales. They were tasked with starting the research towards the board goal. We think it was a pretty inclusive community. Uh, group, all academies represented, uh, both academic groups, uh, core academics, and electives. They were tasked with responding to the board goal and researching it. They took a look at a variety of scheduling options from all over the country. 
Every meeting, these teachers, staff members, took back class schedules from different places that they saw off of websites or through contacts or through people that they had worked with or districts they had been in before hours that had differing schedule models. We took a look at the board goal of efficiency. That group defined efficiency and staffing as measured by the time teachers would be in contact with students. How much time we use, utilize our staff to be in contact with students. One of their key findings right away was in a block schedule, staff teach six of eight periods. That's 75% of the instructional time they were engaged with students. In a seven period day where they were teaching six of seven, that rose to the mid 80s. So at the end of the year, after investigating multiple models of scheduling, at the end of the 2013-14 year, that group in our final faculty meeting posed two questions to staff. Number one, do you favor a change to some other type of scheduling than what we have today? 70% of our staff said, yes, let's look at something different. When presented with the option of a seven period day or a modified flex block incorporating content in the block schedule and the seven period day, melding the two together. The staff, 78% in that vote, favored the seven period day over a flexible block schedule. 78% is a large number for that staff at the high school to say, yeah, let's look at this. We took that as a mandate from our teachers. Let's research it. Let's see what it would really look like on the ground in practice. Our teachers say they want to look at it more. So let's, let's do this. Let's look at it a little further. So then in the 2014-15 school year, this committee was charged with putting together a model of a seven period day with feedback from teachers on what they felt was important in our schedule and to try to put together some kind of a working academic schedule that incorporated their needs, what they considered to be very important, and met the board goal of efficiency in teacher-student contact time. This group includes members from every core academic area, language arts, math, social sciences, uh, includes career and tech ed technical education members, teachers, a career and technical education counselor, Kaylee Armstrong, also the career and technical education coordinator, Deb Jarman. They were not charged with doing anything other than developing what a model might look like. The staff, we felt, had already made the decision in 2013-14 that they really liked this. This group was just charged with putting it together to see what it might look like in practice and giving them some information. One of the things that our staff really felt was important was keeping the time that we currently call mentoring. So within a seven period day, we made sure we incorporated that. We listened to the staff feedback. Yes, seven period day would be cool to look at, but let's keep mentoring. So we did. That committee, as you can see on there, it was uh, Mr. Kip was a part of that committee. And I know that we, we received a lot of feedback from folks on the development of this committee. Why was one person included? Why was another person not included? Why was this group? We could end up with a committee of 50. If we, if we had that. Mr. Morales chose the committee. I asked to be on the committee as the lead associate in charge, not lead associate, but associate in charge of scheduling. I asked to be on the committee. There wasn't, there wasn't room for me on that committee as a third administrator. So Mr. Kim served on that committee. That doesn't mean it's not a valid committee. It was just the, it was the group that he had chosen. And, and I think we did a pretty go good job of finding people from all academic areas and points of view to try to figure out what this might look like. And as the lead associate for the high school, Mr. Kip worked on that throughout. So I'm going to let him describe the components of our seven period day as we designed it. Well, first of all, I want to thank those members on the committee, both in the 2013-14 and the 2014-15 year. 
I think they did a great job. They took it seriously. They did a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time to investigate the options that are out there. Um, ideally, uh, for a high school, it's difficult to create a schedule in which everybody feels that it's the best for their, their classes, their curriculum, and their students. Um, but I think that the committee put together a pretty good system, a, a workable solution to a seven-day period, and took into consideration those things that could be beneficial to our kids, even if it's a change in some of the existing systems that we have. Uh, a couple things that we were limited to when we were creating a seven-period day was the start and end times of the day. Transportation is a big issue in our district. We also have a lot of extracurricular um, and athletic activities. So that time frame in which we have our classes was predefined by our existing schedule. So currently we do have a zero period, um, not very robust curriculum there. I think it's just weights. Um, so there are kids that come in at 7.10 in the morning they have an opportunity for classes. So one of the things that we wanted to do with this committee is maintain the zero period and then have some flexibility later to increase the curricular options for kids in an early part of the day. So a zero period would allow us some flexibility to add uh, additional coursework. If we give options to those kids who really want those extra classes. I know I forced my daughter to take nine credits in her senior year. Uh, I'm probably pretty mean. Uh, but she took a zero hour and then all eight classes. But I don't think she wanted to. Uh, we also wanted to make it a simpler schedule. On an alternating block schedule, there's an odd day and even day. And that's probably one of the biggest questions I'm asked every morning. Are we on an odd day or are we on an even day? Sometimes it gets confusing. A lot of our, our kids that are really like routine, our special education kids, um, they, they like the idea of having a set routine, and the odd even calendar can get confusing. Additionally, just the, the daily schedule gets a bit confusing when you go from 810 to 936, then 942 to 1106, uh, that we tried to set it up as an easy uh, to follow calendar or daily schedule. So we start at 710, we have 50 minute classes with five minute passing period, um, and it makes it pretty easy to follow along the hours. The other major limitation we had is that we have, well now we have close to 2,200 students and we got to feed them. And if you've been up at the high school at lunch, that's a pretty big ordeal. Uh, we have about 560 seats per lunch available for students and at 2,200 you can see that we're, we're pretty packed in four lunch periods. There's no way to go to three, which would have been a little bit easier to, to make a schedule with three lunch periods, but with four, we had to kind of manipulate it so that, and I think that especially some of the mathematicians in the, uh, in the committee were pretty good about this, generating a four lunch period schedule in which we could maintain, as Mr. Nordby had said, the mentoring time. So a 25 minute mentoring, 25 minute lunch, and then a class in this particular fourth period that's of 50 minutes allows us to fit that all in. So we maintain a mentoring uh, class in which the teacher can help monitor students without necessarily a direct curriculum. And then of course we end our day at 320, uh, just as we do now to maintain the, uh, the transportation issues, as well as the activities after school. Yes. Well, that, the next thing that we had to look at is if we had a schedule that conformed to seven periods, was how are we gonna get our kids to graduate? Right now we have a opportunity for up to 32 credits on a standard eight period uh, schedule over four years. Uh, we require 26.5 credits to graduate. How would we work this if there was only 28 uh, available hours over, uh, or standard hours over a four year, four year period? Uh, the counselors suggested, especially Kaylee since she was on our committee, that it would be more difficult to kind of stagger that one year at a time. It would be better to take the two years of students that exist in the high school and continue their 26.5 credit requirement. And this is all based on whether, if we were to implement that in the 2016-17 school year, for the seven period day. So all classes after 2017 would go to a 24 credit graduation requirement. And there was a lot of debate over how we, how we were gonna do that and the motivation behind that. First, we had to look at Kansas State High School graduation requirements. Uh, the, the state requires 21 credits. 
uh, the core curriculum, four language arts, social studies, uh, three credits, math three, science three. We had to maintain that. That's required by the state. Uh, physical education, they require one. Fine arts as well, one credit. Um, at this point, no computer technology courses are required in the state. And uh, elective courses are six. That gets you to 21. We also wanted to look at the Board of Regents qualified admissions because we want to provide college and career readiness standards for our students. So qualified admissions allow students to, if they graduate from the high school in Kansas, go to a Kansas uh, Board of Regents school. And they require a minimum of 16 re re required courses in addition to the, uh, uh, the curriculum that is available in high schools. The only difference there really um, is that they don't require any physical education, fine arts, or computer technology, and they only really require three credits of, of electives. And then we looked at what we currently do with our eight period block. We have three and a half language arts with one credit of speech. So we have four and a half credits that are essentially language arts. And then we, we conform to the state requirements in social studies, math, science. We have an additional 0.5 in physical education. So an extra half credit of PE for students that graduate uh, Guard City High School. Uh, we have a full credit of fine arts. And we have a full credit of computer technology. And electives, nine, uh, nine and a half credits of electives. That's a lot. Um, and that's, that's feasible uh, with the 32 credit possibilities. But in addition to that, we also offer night school and zero hour, as well as E2020 ingenuity. So kids have an opportunity to do a lot within not only the 32 credits, but additional support and um, ability to take classes that they want. So then we, we put that all together and we looked at what do we really need to do at Garden City High School to get a 24 credit system for graduation. And if you look at uh, column for the seven period day, you'll see that we maintain the language arts and the ELA standards of a, a one credit speech and three and a half of language arts. And maintain social studies, mathematics, science. We did drop physical education by um, 0.5, one half credit. And fine arts, we left it a credit. And computer technology, we dropped a half credit as well. The electives still remain at eight, eight credits. So it's a reduction of one and a half elective, one and a half credits of electives in terms of the graduation requirements. Um, when we looked at that, we thought, well, what do we really need to have these kids do? and what opportunities can we give them? And this seemed to be a, a logical and workable solution to the graduation requirements of the high school. Um, in addition to that, we thought about, okay, how can we take that initial schedule that we put together and add opportunities for kids? Well, we already have some of those in place. Night school's happening right now. Today's the first day, 3.45 to 5.15. We offer social studies, math, um, we have speech, and we also have E2020 Ingenuity for options of classes and English. And so we have those pieces in place. And then the zero hour, we, if we added a more robust curriculum, it would add the ability for kids to take as many of these courses in an alternate opportunity as well. So that's what the committee kind of put together um, as one, looking at what we have now, looking at what we think should be required for graduation, and putting it together in a workable schedule for the high school. So we took that plan, class schedule, credit requirements, and then we took it to our teachers. We met with every teacher in every PLC, went directly to them and talked about, Mr. Kip did that for every one of them, to talk about advantages and disadvantages. And some of those that were generated by the committee and some of those that were generated by the teachers we talked to are what we're going to present to you next. Uh, first of all, an advantage. Daily contact with students. Seven period day schedules provide an extra 75 minutes per two weeks of student contact time. 1,350 minutes or 22 hours per year. That's almost one month of instruction time that we could get teacher, students together in contact. We consider that a pretty big advantage. Uh, our staff is awesome. The more time we can get our teachers with our kids in an instructional setting, I'm bored. Uh, our teachers are great. 
they, they do a wonderful job trying to facilitate that more. Uh, less reteaching, consistency and delivery, better comprehension. In a block schedule, if a student sees a teacher on a Thursday, they're not going to see that teacher again until Monday. Unless the teacher has an activity or the student has an activity, in that case, it'd be the next Wednesday. And you could go a week or more sometimes without seeing your instructor, without meeting and having contact. It's a long time. Seven period day reduces that. Uh, I know as the parent of a student in activities, uh, just happens to be the way that the activity schedule works out, but a couple of springs ago, my daughter missed the afternoon of odd classes, five of the last seven class meetings. Basically, the last three weeks of school, she saw her afternoon teachers on odd days twice, and then took finals. Seven period day reduces that for the teachers and the kids. Increased student engagement. Teachers have reported to us they like the idea of finding uh, fun, engaging activities that students can do with rigor in a 50-minute setting. Bang, bang, bang makes the class move faster. Students, students have reported to us they like that too. Fewer issues with activities, athletic events, alternating class schedules. I already mentioned that. Uh, and Mr. Kipp is correct. The most commonly asked question this morning at Garden City High School was, even day or odd day? What is it? Even day or odd day? I don't know. Especially on the day next Tuesday, after we've had a holiday and missed Monday? Even day, odd day. Yeah, we should just put placards on and walk around the hallways to say, even day or odd day. Uh, students not be forced into electives they don't need or desire. Talking to counselors, that's a real happening at our high school. Talking to teachers that have to do, or, uh, principals that do discipline with kids. Why are you in that class? I don't know. Didn't really want to be. Had to be put in here. Folks, I have 553 students currently enrolled in campus patrol, walking, or student aid. And that is just the fall semester. I've got at least that many enrolled in the spring. That eighth elective. Got to put you in something. Class sizes could be reduced by efficiency and staffing. Right now, 25% of my teaching staff roughly are off at all hours, all hours of the day. With a teaching six of seven, that number goes down to about seven, about 15, 14 point something. We rounded up to 15, things 14.7. That means more options to place kids in schedules. That means lower class sizes. When you have more teachers available to teach each hour, you have more places to put kids. When you have more places to put kids, we can reduce the class sizes two and a half to three students depending on the total enrollment that you've got at that time, at this time. And right now, folks, I'm looking at close to 2,200 kids. We were the fifth largest school in the state last year on count day. We may be the second by the time we're done this year. Uh, I don't need a reduction in force. It's 2,200 kids and they keep coming. I need all the teachers I can get and the ability to schedule them as flexibly as I can, including sliding teacher schedules to allow more of them to teach in zero hour and perhaps end their day earlier or come later and teach an extra block at the end of the day. I've got teachers begging me to try that right now. The only problem is I can't afford it. I need them all, with 25% of them off every hour, I need them all on duty as much as I can get them just during the 8, 10 to 3, 20 time. Having more teachers on duty allows me some flexibility. I've got a college social teacher that has been asking me for two or three years to get a zero hour <laughs> class, and I've got kids who will enroll in it. I can't make it happen because I need him teaching all I can during the day. And I don't have the overloads to pay him in the morning. Seven period day allows me to do that and to be flexible with the scheduling and give some opportunities to kids who want to go above and beyond. There'll be some kids who want to stay in those electives, those 553. They'll want to stay in a seven period day perhaps and not be put into an elective just to fill a schedule. Other kids are going to want to take more. And with a seven period day, we can make that happen.
that uh, we and I guess we already touched on this ahead of time with, with the tip, added course offerings in zero hour at night school, we could really expand our curriculum. We could do a lot more, give a lot more opportunities to kids. My daughter graduated Garden City High School with 23 transferable credits. We could provide opportunities perhaps for, for kids to go above and beyond and do even more, more AP opportunities in that time. Seven period day would also allow for us to schedule in classes for MTSS like we had before in the other high school. In, in, the, old, in the old high school, before we kind of got hit with some staff reductions, we were able to have some classes, KMA, KRA, those type of MTSS classes. MTSS, MTSS is going to be required of us by the state. This allows us some flexibility in our scheduling to put those classes into the day and support those students with academic needs. Uh, the last one, increasing rigor with fewer failing class allowances. You need 26 and a half out of 32 possible. You can fail 11 semesters and still graduate on time. Going to a seven period day reduces that. Places some uh, academic, I guess it reduces the, the failing class allowances of, eh, I got another shot, I'll try it later puts the onus back on the student for academic performance and graduating instead of making a kind of built-in allowance for it. Okay, uh, disadvantages developed by teachers, developed by community, uh, committee members. The first disadvantage they came up with that I think we've addressed a couple times here tonight. Current schedule allows for one and a half more electives required for graduation, gives the opportunity for more elective choice. Folks, currently 25 to 35 percent of, of, of my students will graduate early. They will walk across the stage in May, but they will be done a year, half a year early. They're leaving elective tables, elective choices on the table on their own. They're choosing not to stay and take those electives. We had uh, Dr. Daggett here speaking to us, nationally renowned speaker, speaking to us last year. Uh, Ray McNulty, and one of their comments was, if the kid's ready to move and to, and to leave, why are we arbitrarily holding on to them, forcing them? We're allowing kids to expand and to leave early. They're leaving elective options on the table on their own. Also, over 95% of students who have the option in the spring of their senior year to take reduced schedules do. They're not choosing to take those extra electives on their own, of their own, their own free will. Right now, they take five credits if they're involved in athletics, or they take what they need to graduate. A lot of them are exploring options at the community college. They're choosing on their own not to take advantage of these selective opportunities. We're holding on to it. We're worried about some of those. Kids are choosing not to take it. Seven period day schedule would require additional planning for testing purposes so that students would not experience multiple assessments on the same day. This came from students as a student concern. I don't want to be hit with seven tests on the same day. Understandable, just as they don't want to be hit with four tests on the same day right now. And that was, that was an understandable concern from students. The last two Disadvantages or barriers are beyond our control at Garden City High School. They are both deal with planning time and time for professional learning communities which are negotiated items. Uh, there, isn't, there isn't anything that I can influence as far as, as make a change or an adjustment, neither Mr. Kipp or anybody on the committee. Uh, there would be a reduction in professional learning community time down to one 55 minute section per week. Uh, Seven period scheduled teachers would receive fewer uh, loss of plan time, less plan time. And that's a negotiated item. That's beyond our, beyond our reach, beyond our control also. Okay. With all of the advantages, the disadvantages, the schedule, the credits, we went to staff, as I said earlier. We went to each of them, to their PLCs. Let's talk about it. And we did. We had great discussions. 
78% of my staff was, hey, let's look at it. Let's look at the seven period day. We did. We brought them back. Here's what it would look like. Here's what could happen. After hearing that, the advantages, the disadvantages, we put it to one more last vote. One simple question. Do you favor a change to the seven period day? And roughly two-thirds of my staff, 65%, said yes. Even knowing the drawbacks, I still favor a seven period day. So with that in mind, the work that was done, the three votes, the staff, the two votes, I guess, three questions, uh, we, we proposed uh, a change to the seven period day. And uh, now it's, like I said, in in other hands than ours as far as negotiating through that. But we've come today to give you our, our report. We feel that on the subject, as far as researching it and developing, that we've, uh, we've done our work as far as that board goal. I think we've been pretty thorough with it. And our teachers have put a lot of time and effort into, into the discussion. 